Okie dokie, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our Cooking with Cannabinoids webinar. My name is Elizabeth Bowen. I'm academic coordinator here at Oxidam University and I'm going to be moderating today's events. I'm just going to be in the background making sure that your questions are answered and everything runs smoothly. So let's begin with a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. If this is your first Zoom meeting somehow, here is how you engage. Zoom has a wonderful chat box feature which you are encouraged to use at any point throughout today's webinar. You can use that to chat with each other, share resources, uh, ask questions. There's also the Q&A tool. The Q&A tool I love for events like this because you can ask a question, you can vote on other, on other students' questions, and I can let you know if we're going to be addressing your, your questions live or asynchronously. So do I encourage you to participate in the chat, participate in the Q&A, and um, at, the, at the appropriate time, use the raise hand tool if you'd like to voice a question. Um, otherwise, now we know the lay of the land, let's, let's get talking about today's events. So we're gonna be learning all about cooking with cannabinoids. Um, and it's my pleasure to be introducing you to your speakers today. Um, they are the co-authors of the Cooking with Cannabinoids uh, book, uh, which is talking all about how to enhance your experience using your diet. And uh, I have two speakers to introduce. Uh, first up is going to be our chef Daniel Green. Chef Green is aka the model cook is an internationally renowned healthy eating expert, media personality and award winning author. Throughout his expansive career, he's cooked for royalty and dignitaries and continues to design healthy menus for airlines and hotels around the world. Daniel's simple approach to healthy eating has been so popular that he's been featured in numerous magazines in the UK, the US and across Asia. He's currently a member of the Culinary Investor Panel for the first season of Food Network's Food Fortunes. And he, along with many other chefs on the panel, uh, he, along with other chefs on the panel, decides whether or not to invest in a new product being presented by an Epicurean entrepreneur. Additionally, Daniel serves as the judge on the Food Network show Kitchen Inferno. And so I'm very excited to see uh, his demonstrations coming on in a bit. But we're also wonderfully joined today by Dr. Daniel, sorry, by Dr. Joseph Faustine. Uh, Dr. Joseph is going to be uh, joining us for Q&A throughout and at the end of the session. And uh, let me tell you a little bit more about him. He is an assistant professor of clinical medicine at Columbia University and at Quinnipiac School of Medicine. He served as, as the director of integrative medicine at Stanford Hospital in Connecticut and saw over 45,000 patients uh, in his 15 years in his cult consultation practice, treating a myriad of serious chronic medical conditions. Dr. Joe is a multiple award winning and extensively published medical researcher in the field of botanicals and nutrition, and he's also certified in medical acupuncture, clinical hypnosis, Oh, oh, don't go away. And holds a homeopathic physician license from the state of Connecticut. Faustine uses natural uh, approaches instead of pharmaceuticals. Oh, everything's going away. I apologize. Instead of I'm oh, it going away again. There we go. So, to treat severe and chronic medical conditions. Nutrition is a critical component of his treatment plans, and he also has extensive experience recommending CBD and medicinal cannabis to his patients. So he's going to tell you a little bit more about himself. I'm going to uh, making sure that everybody has access to some discount codes for if you want to check out more about his book. And uh, let's please welcome Dr. Joe Faustine. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, so I am a, uh, a a bit of a Zoom newbie. I'm not a Zoom newbie because I've, I've I've been in the pandemic. But um, so I'm actually just to make sure I can go through my slides. Um, I do not have access to your chats. So Elizabeth is going to be reading and prompting any questions you have, and there'll be different points where we can uh, answer any questions. I hope I'm uh, I'm able to answer. If I don't know the answer, I promise you, I'll tell you. Uh, so, um, you know, today, essentially, what we're going to do is talk about uh, conceptually um, this concept of a cannabinoid rich diet. Um, Daniel's going to do um, two cooking demonstrations. Uh, if you want to cook along, you can feel free. I know that we did send everybody the recipes so you could prepare them and do them. They're seven, eight minutes uh, a piece um, if you feel that uh, uh, you want to cook. And if not, then you can just watch him cook, uh, which is what he does on the Food Network. Um, so uh, I'm going to very briefly, because I want to go over uh, kind of lecture components. That is the book. 
um, you can feel free to get it. And I do believe there are discount codes so that I shall uh, leave to the great people at Oaksterdam and our publishers. But um, this is a beautiful book uh, and it's really conceptually talking about the uh, cannabinoid rich diet. And so I'll tell you all about that. And then we're gonna hit five different cannabinoid rich foods uh, which I think it's important for you to understand their health benefits uh, beyond just the fact they stimulate the endocannabinoid system, um, but also uh, to be able to use them. The book is 80% recipes so that you are putting together food that tastes good. Um, and so very briefly, when we go lecture components, there are not a lot of slides here, but I'm going to go over very briefly something that I know almost all of you already know, but I believe that the members of the audience who maybe are not aware of this, we're going to do a 30 second um, primer on the endocannabinoid system. We're mostly going to get into the entourage effect because that essentially is what the book is based on. Then Daniel's going to cook the first recipe. I'm going to talk about the two star ingredients of the first recipe, why they are the star ingredients, what their health benefits are, and most importantly, how they stimulate the endocannabinoid system, and they don't do it in the same way, hence the entourage effect. Then we'll have a second cookie demonstration, followed by the star ingredient of the second recipe, and then two other foods that work on the endocannabinoid cannabinoid system in a different way that I think are important. And I think that the point of the story is for us to try and use these foods as often because they have a myriad of health benefits, but they are actually working on the endocannabinoid system in different ways. So um, what is the endocannabinoid system? I know you've all learned this just for anyone in the audience who is not aware of its importance. It's a complex cell signaling system and uh, it's stimulated by the major cannabinoids. There are obviously many, many, many cannabinoids, 140 at my last count, I believe, uh, THC and CBD being the two most commonly known. There are terpenes, et cetera. There's, this is a complexity of this plant. Um, well, what does it do? It's basically the homeostatic mechanism. It is how we get back into balance. And I've given this lecture many times to doctors and I am embarrassed to say, and I'm a Western trained physician with a fellowship in integrative medicine, that most of my physician colleagues who are not uh, particularly familiar with integrative medicine have no concept they even have this system of the body. And it's incredibly important because it is essentially the homeostatic system of the body, meaning it's going to help with regulation of sleep, mood, stress, metabolism, appetite, digestion, learning, memory, fertility, bone, liver, cardiovascular health. I'm just reading a list obviously pain, inflammation, all of these things. So it's incredibly important in the body. And so just to conceptualize, there is some kind of trauma to the body and uh, the endocannabinoid system is then activated. And that is what gets us back into homeostasis or balance. So it's working on multiple other systems of the body and it's incredibly important. There is some clinical evidence of a thing called clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. Um, and I'm not gonna give you a lot of studies though there are. I'm also not gonna to talk too much about CBD and THC because you guys are well aware of that. I'm gonna talk about foods that do what they do. Um, and so uh, what we realize from this is that it may be that things like chronic conditions like migraine, irritable bowel, fibromyalgia may have a relative deficiency in stimulation of the endocannabinoid system. Now, I've seen 45,000 patients for integrated medicine. I can tell you migraine, IBS, and fibromyalgia are complex diseases, and it's not just one thing. If it was one thing, we'd have fixed it. Uh, so it's actually more complicated than that, but an element of a deficiency, a lack of activity, a lack of stimulation of the endocannabinoid system probably plays a role. So the history is very brief. I think everybody knows who this gentleman is. He very kindly accepted a copy of my book. He was very excited about it. As I said, the book is essentially based on the, the entourage or the cascade effect. That is, of course, Professor Rafi Mahulam. He is the godfather of cannabis research. And uh, so very briefly, his story is the story 
in my opinion, of cannabinoids and cannabis research in the last 50 years. Uh, obviously, cannabis has been used for thousands of years by humans. It's in the Ebers Papyrus, which is an ancient Egyptian medical text, along with opium and senna. Uh, and that was uh, three and a half thousand years ago. So we're not doing anything new. We are doing something that has been used by humans for thousands of years. So 1964, Professor Mahulam takes cannabis sativa uh, and he isolates THC. Uh, and then in 1984, we work out that we have CB1 receptors in the brain. Uh, they're one of the most uh, abundant G-coupling receptors of the brain. Um, and then in 1981, uh, 82, so, uh, uh, 89, sorry, we work out that we have CB2 receptors in the body that are associated with signaling inflammation. They're in multiple different sites. Again, you guys all know this, so I'm going to blank through it fast to remind us. So when we get to the point, which is the foods, you'll understand some context. Um, and then from my point of view, very interestingly, obviously the body has its own cannabinoids that we must have our cannabinoids. If we have CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors, we must have the agonist, as they say in pharmacology, which is the thing that stimulates those receptors. And that's 2-AG and anandamide. And they are made from omega-6 fatty acids, which will become important later on in my talk. And then the main part of the concept for the book is the entourage effect, which is now 20 years ago, uh, 20 three years ago, which was a postulation by Dr. Uh, Mahulam, Professor Mahulam, that because cannabinoids, cannabis has multiple tens, even hundreds uh, or more cannabinoids, and they're all affecting the endocannabinoid system a different way, more is, 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 is going to essentially augment the effect. So this one's going to stimulate in this way, and this thing is going to stimulate in this way, and this one's going to do this in this way. This might have a slight inhibitory effect, but the whole picture is to move this forward and have more of a clinical effect. And there are actually studies showing that if you use uh, THC and CBD, as opposed to just THC, it may help with things like cancer, uh, uh, cancer associated pain. There are some clinical studies on that. Um, so why are we interested in the entourage effect? So honestly, um, I have done quite a lot of work with supplement companies and one of the very big supplement companies uh, asked Daniel and I to get involved in looking at CBD, which I use uh, very commonly in my practice. And what I was interested in about in the CBD was that they were putting in black pepper. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So obviously I then got into this and realized that um, black pepper contains a cannabinoid, actually terpene, a terpene that stimulates the endocannabinoid system. And that led me on my little journey, this is how the book essentially was written, of looking at other foods that have an effect on the endocannabinoid system. And that's why we came up with a cannabinoid rich diet and a beautiful cookbook to give everybody the concept of what are the foods that you could eat to help augment the effect of, if you're taking CBD, CBD, if you're taking THC, THC, if you're taking uh, combinations, then this is just going to augment that effect. Just to remind us, um, an agonist in pharmacology, an agonist is where you um, stimulate the receptors. So just, uh, there's, a, there's an important word. We use it in mega medicine all the time. So an agonist stimulates the, the receptors, an antagonist essentially blocks the receptors and therefore prevents them from being stimulated. So that's important because I'm going to talk about agonists and antagonists. So now let's go on to uh, Chef Daniel and uh, let's watch him make a delicious uh, plant-based recipe. Thank you, Dr. Joe, and thanks all of you for watching today. I really appreciate it and getting to know a little bit about cannabinoids, which was kind of new to me. But Dr. Joe uh, really gave me such an education on how this cookbook um, could be used to help you de-stress and how it worked to give you ingredients that are so good for you. And the ingredients I know you've all got. I mean, it's things like rosemary and turmeric and cacao and nutmeg, and all of these have just got recipes. Oh, I'm gonna make that one a little bit later. Apple cinnamons, that's what I'm making for you today. Plus the easiest, most delicious way to get cannabinoids in your system and it is truffle. So I've got a truffle oil. You can buy them very inexpensively. They are just so rich and beautiful in flavor and aroma. 
my goodness. I mean, you can spend like five to $50. So look at a good one and I tell you, it's just magic. We've got some fettuccine, we've got some basil, we've got some parsley, garlic, cheese, and a poached egg and a tiny bit of butter, which I normally don't cook, but I am today because we're allowed to when I'm using these ingredients. So come over here. I've just poached the most perfect egg. And that was just about four to five minutes with a third vinegar and some water. I'm gonna turn the heat on and get that warmed up a little. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of butter to this dish and get that nicely cooked. So with this fettuccine, I'm gonna melt that butter down. Then I'm gonna cut up a few of my chopped herbs removing the stalks from the parsley as much as I can, and the same with the basil. Just discard those. Get a little bit more. And, and always using fresh herbs gives so much color to food and it just brings it alive and it's fabulous. So if you can, it's the best way to do it. I'm gonna get a big knife and chop that. And I wanna grate in a tiny bit of garlic. Now, I know most of you use garlic peelers, but what I do, very simply is just give that a bit of a bash let me turn that heat down and the peel comes off and then it's a really nice way to get perfect garlic come take a look just give it a little bit of a grate again it's so much easier use the whole bulb or the whole clove rather and you don't have any waste and now we've got garlic butter Noodles, that's all it is so far. Fettuccine, bit of garlic butter. To that, I'm gonna add a little bit of pepper. Pepper is another ingredient that we use here, um, which helps with your endocannabinoid system. It is really, really rich in cannabinoids. And I know uh, Dr. Joe's gonna be talking to you about cannabinoids and what that means. And I know so many of you know about this, but it's a really interesting concept that our food and our ingredients can help us de-stress, sleep better, and release the cannabinoids for our system, which is just amazing. And it's so easy because they're delicious ingredients. Turn that heat up a little. Okay, lots of fresh vegetables. I'm gonna take peel of a knife, give it a really nice fine chop. Go the other way. And then we've got some beautiful herbs that are gonna just release flavor. So what I'm gonna do is start off by putting a little bit of them in there and then give it a turn. Um, Dr. Joe's gonna take lots of questions after. Um, we were so excited to work on this project for the book. It's my 12th cookbook, but this was just interesting because I've always focused on healthy, low fat dishes, low carb dishes, but this was just a really interesting concept because everyone wants to feel a little bit more de-stressed and better. So these ingredients are so powerful. And Dr. Joe's all about the power of food rather than medicine. Okay, so that goes in there. We get a little bit of our Parmesan cheese. That goes in, oh, it's delicious. It is so easy. Now I did pre-cook the pasta and all I did was heat it through but I drained it. If you do, and it's a good trick, if you wanna make pasta and you wanna cook it ahead of time, cook it to the instructions, drain it, put it in a Ziploc bag with some olive oil and that way it keeps it nice and separate and you don't have like a big lump stuck together and just reheat it. So if you're having guests over, it's a great way to entertain. Okay, now <gasps> the magic, the truffle oil, a little bit dramatic, but I have to be dramatic because it's such a brilliant ingredient. That goes in, it goes in at the end because I want it all for the aroma and the flavor. And now we're talking top class, top, top class restaurant cuisine. Nice, huge comfort food helping. Does it smell good? Oh, that smells good. And we're gonna take a poached egg. If you don't like um, the excess vinegar, all I do, is you rinse that through a little bit of water. That poached egg goes on top, a little bit more parsley to give it color, 
and then I'm going to cut through that in a few moments. But there you've got your first dish. Easy to make, wonderful. Anyone can do it, rich in cannabinoids. Now it's dessert time. We'll leave that over there. Okie dokie, we've got a uh, hand raised. Raphael, you are able to unmute if you would like to ask a question. Or type it into the chat. One can. Or type it into the chat. Absolutely, yeah. Shall I? Shall I go? And then, if if while we're doing that, let me talk about the two um, essentially star ingredients that we used in the recipe and, and and why they're being used. So the first one, I think we can all see what that is. That's black pepper. So um, I'm going to go over what black pepper is, and then um, most importantly, I'm going to talk about what it actually does to the endocannabinoid system, but. You don't want to just consume black pepper just because it happens to have uh, cannabinoid effects on the cannabinoid system. There are health benefits, which is we should be looking at in a more holistic way, all the reasons why black pepper should be your friend. So uh, Piper Negrum, this is actually something uh, we use all the time uh, in integrated medicine um, uh, for a variety of reasons, which we'll go over. This is the king of spices. It's the most traded spice in the world. It starts off as this vine-like plant, and then it has the fruit of the vine, which is the peppercorn. And the picture I just showed you was the peppercorn. Those are dried and cooked and ground and literally when you are grinding pepper you are grinding these the the, the dried fruit essentially uh, it's native to southeast uh southern india and vietnam uh this is really literally thousands and thousands of years of cooking um it is also in traditional medicine and so in integrative medicine we are always interested what have our predecessors, our forefathers from around the world, what have they been using it for for thousands of years? Because usually whatever they've been using it for likely is going to have some clinical effects. And so it is used potently uh, for antibacterial, uh, its antibacterial properties, which I'll go into why that would be the case uh, shortly. Um, and also it seems to have an effect on gas and um, uh, as a digestive. Um, Black pepper is high in vitamin K, which is important in bone health and obviously in clotting. Manganese, which is a cofactor in multiple different enzymatic uh, activities of the body. Um, so let's talk a little bit <clears throat> about the essential oil. So um, plants have these oils. They're probably protective, which is why the certain uh, varieties of plants make these oils um, and they may uh, uh, they may have a, a signaling effect uh, between one plant and another, but they also um, probably prevent uh, infections of any type to the plant. And so when you take orange, for example, which is an essential oil, and you squeeze the orange, you're going to get from the peel, you get this kind of uh, uh, fatty uh, substance. That's actually the essential oil of orange, and that's going to have um, medicinal properties. So the essential oil of black pepper contains BCP, which is beta carophyllin. And beta carophyllin, um, this is a terpene uh, you're all aware of, is a CB2 receptor agonist. So it's working on these CB2 receptors. Uh, it's very interesting um, because uh, uh, we use in clinical aerotherapy, we will use black pepper, not neat, but in a carrier oil, topically on arthritic joints. So it's very interesting that it's classically used as an anti-inflammatory, and it seems to be doing that perhaps through CB2 receptors, through stimulating the CB2 receptors to reduce inflammation. Um, it also has analgesic effects. So the BCP, with it, which is the beta carophyllin, um, gives the pepper its aroma. It is potently antioxidant, uh, uh, um, but it has lots of antioxidant properties. But the other thing about it is like most essential oils, it's potently antimicrobial, which is why you could see that it was used in uh, 
Chinese and Indian uh, and, and Vietnamese uh, tr traditional healing, it may be used for bacterial infections because the essential oil and the beta carophyllum essent part of the, of the essential oil is going to have potent antimicrobial agents uh, properties. So just to give you frame of reference, I think we all know this because because BCP is quite a well known beta carophyllum, beta C BCP is quite a well known terpene. Uh, cannabis sativa that you're all uh, very aware of in Oaksterdam uh, is between four and 40% almost BCP. So it's one of the most, most important terpenes. Um, black pepper is about maybe eight to 10% of that, but using it is to add, see, you know, just adding uh, essentially more beta carophyllin in your diet, in addition to whatever you're using in terms of THC and CBD. So black pepper is one of the uh, spices that we love and we should be using for those myriad of reasons and also because it's going to work on CB2 receptors to stimulate them. The second ingredient, this I love, I get very excited about this, is truffles. So remember, Daniel, when he does the recipes, we didn't just put every single uh, cannabinoid rich food into a blender and just drink it because that tastes awful. He's a brilliant chef. He's written 12 books. And so he puts these together. But the point of the book is that he's going to have more than one cannabinoid in each recipe. So he's going to make sure that you're using truffles and you're using uh, um, uh, uh, you're using um, uh, black pepper, the black pepper, a CB2 agonist uh, working on the CB2 receptors and the truffles. I'm excited to tell you what that does before we get into the next cooking demonstration. So truffles, tuber melanin spore. Forum. This is the fruit light. It's a fungus. We all know that it grows under the ground and it's essentially growing near the roots of oak trees. And this is you're playing the long game here because it's going to take seven to 10 years to really colonize these roots. Why do the roots? Why does it grow near the oak trees? Because it's going to get nutrients from the oaks. It's a symbiotic relationship, but it also increases the surface area on the roots. So there's an opportunity for the oak to get more nutrients too. So it's all good for everybody involved. There are multiple different species. This is really called the diamond of the kitchen. Daniel loves truffles. He's a, he's a well-known chef. Uh, we have black, we have winter, we have summer, we have burgundy. Uh, my friends, this can get expensive. We realize that. The more, the more concentrated the truffle, the better. But if you're not able to sit there and blow, a, you know, two hundred dollars on truffles, you can do truffle infused oils. You just have to make sure that they are actually of good quality and actually have truffle in them, uh, not just the smell, because this is not about smells. This is actually about the truffle. Um, the history of truffles is uh, that it's been around for again four thousand years. Humans have been eating truffles for four thousand years. Uh, and uh, the ancient Greeks thought truffles were made by lightning strikes hitting warm earth. And that was how a truffle was made. Truffles are spectacular from a nutritional point of view. And why? Because they are a complete protein. So to remind everybody what that means, we have essential amino acids. Those are the building blocks of protein that we have to consume. You cannot make them in your body. There are many less plant protein uh, foods that are that contain all the amino acids we need, all the essential amino acids, but truffles are one of them. So this is a great, great food. It also has carbohydrate, obviously it's got fat, it's got calcium, magnesium, manganese, and iron. Calcium, magnesium have multiple effects on nerve conduction and uh, on, uh, I mean, just a myriad of things, bone health, manganese, again, iron, uh, important in red blood cells, but also important in a load of other things, in 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 including a neurotransmitter effect, uh, interesting interesting thing about ADD and iron, which we could get into at some point, um, the truffle has an oil. The oil, therefore, is antimicrobial, has antioxidants and potentially anti-cancer uh, uh, compounds in it. Those are all in a test tube. So what does it do to the endocannabinoid system? And then I'll have Daniel give you the second recipe. Truffles are very, very cool. Basically, you have these truffle pigs, we've all seen them uh, in pictures in Southern Europe, uh, and they're going over Southern France, and they can dig down four feet to go and find the truffles. And then they eat the truffles, which they're not supposed to be doing, they're supposed to be giving the truffles to the truffle pig owner. Why are they eating the truffles? 
because the truffles, my friend, are pure anandamide. They are literally made of anandamide. And to remind everybody, that anandamide is a CB1 receptor agonist. It stimulates the CB1 receptors in the brain. And anandamide is uh, what we make in our brain. It's uh, and, and in our body. It's a uh, um, it is the bliss molecule. So truffles are full of anandamide. Why? Is it that they would be full of amandamide because truffles don't have a uh, endocannabinoid system? And the answer is, it's a beautiful thing. The pigs are going to eat the truffles. The spores are in the, uh, are in the truffle. The spores are resistant to acid. They will go through the digestive system of the pig. And then 24 hours or less later, the spores will be spread all over southern France in the stool of these pigs. And that's how they propagate. That's how they get to all these oak trees. Um, and so we love them because anandamide is going to stimulate CB1, CB2 receptors as an agonist. Um, so I'm going to let Daniel get to recipe number two. Uh, are there questions, Elizabeth? Certainly. So I'm going to go through the questions in the Q&A first, and then I'm going to uh, give it a go with that raised hand. Uh, Mia has a hand raised and Raphael has asked his question uh, in writing. So. Right. I guess all these. So first up is a question from Marco. And Marco's asking, are we saying that black pepper, truffle oil, etc., have cannabinoids or just terpenes? Oh, so um, yeah, so you're, you're being absolutely right. When we wrote the book to try and explain to everybody that there are terpenes and there are cannabinoids is not something you can write in a typo. We realize that there are cannabinoids and there are terpenes. Uh, beta carophylline is obviously a terpene. Anandamide is an uh, is, a, is 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 a, is a cannabinoid. So the book actually has multiple terpenes in food and multiple other uh, cannabinoids. We're not going to go over all of them tonight, but uh, yes, I realize that that's uh, that, that being very specific. Beta carophylline and the beta carophylline foods are terpenes, but they're the same terpenes as you're going to get in uh, cannabis sativa or uh, oil, frankly. Um, uh, so they're definitely something that you would want to eat. Uh, and then we'll get on to some of the other foods and how they stimulate the cannabinoid system, the endocannabinoid system. We call it the cannabinoid cookbook because it's just an easier way to put a very complicated subject together. Thank you so much. Mm. I appreciate I appreciate the, the, the deeper dive for this. Yeah, <laughs> I was expecting that question. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Next up, we have a question from Cody. Cody's asking, when you make cannabis butter, should you decarb the bud or would you say it's dependent upon what you're going to cook with it? Um, I think it's dependent on what you're going to cook with it. That, that's what I would go with. Yeah, from, from, from my experience, I would say if your intended effect from the resulting product, it would be THC, you know, Delta 9 THC in that experience, it's probably a good idea to decarboxylate your, your material beforehand, right. just right. You, get, you get a higher percentage of, 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 you know, a better extraction rate that way. Right. Um, but there are cooking techniques you can use that will... Uh, decarboxylate during the cooking process. Um, there are also, uh, there's a risk of losing some of your precious cannabinoids during the cooking right. process as well. So no question uh, about that, which is, and remember, uh, some of these uh, compounds are aromatic and therefore yeah. they are quite delicate. So hence the reason why cooking has limitations. Absolutely. So short answer, it depends mm. on what you're going to cook with it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, here's the question from Raphael we've been waiting for. Uh, he's asking, uh, we need to use, uh, do we need to use cannabis in the recipes or are the ingredients there to make sure the endocannabinoid system works? So it's such a good question and I love it. Um, this does not have, the book does not have any THC recipes or CBD recipes. The concept is that the, especially the audience I'm speaking to now, I'm assuming you are using uh, CBD, THC and cannabinoids in your life uh, for a myriad of reasons, uh, many of which I'm going to support myself. Uh, this is more about introducing it to the world because we want to make this not just kind of to certain people who are very familiar with this, with this, but to everybody and to a lot of people, including my own physician colleagues, I have to educate them about the whole system. Um, but the idea is that uh, having a cannabinoid rich diet is only going to augment the effect of what you're already doing. I make no mistake about this. You're taking 
10 milligrams of THC or something similar, uh, eating a cannabinoid rich diet is not gonna have the same effect as 10 milligrams of THC. I, I'm well aware of that, but it's more conceptually that these are foods, especially there are 11 in our book and they have lots of recipes so you can combine them together. And the idea is that what you're trying to do is just improve what, how you eat in general because the health because the recipes are healthy, but specifically focusing on, on, on I said, I suppose it's putting an emphasis on foods that are high in cannabinoids every day as often as possible, most of which are healthy. So I think you should be using this as a diet to keep along with whatever your, uh, um, your consumption of, uh, um, uh, of CBD and THC are. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great questions, even better answers. 100%. And um, <laughs> we'll be moving on to questions. Oh, do we have any more questions before I move on to our next video? Yes, there's a final question here from Shannon. Hey, Shannon. Uh, and she's uh, saying that she's loving the concept. Could infusing these recipes with cannabis add extra benefits for our endocannabinoid system? 100%. That was so easy. Yes, of course it will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I hope I'm speaking to friends. I want to be honest. We kind of steered a little way, a little bit from actually using CBD and THC because we are trying to, again, expand. This is for the movement. I'm a big proponent of CBD, THC, and using it medicinally. Uh, uh, I, I use it in my clinical practice. And so, but we need to get it to everybody. And there's a lot of people who have, um, uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, not always exactly the right information as to what it does and the fact that it's actually part of the normal functioning human body with your own system that does this. Uh, and so we specifically went with food because that was going to be less controversial. Uh, um, I'm sure I would love to write a book, but you've got plenty of books where you do infuse with CBD and THC. Um, I'm sure Daniel could come out with some really cool recipes. It was really that conceptually we were trying to use cascade, the entourage effect mm -hmm. to just add this in your diet. Um, and you're going to see some of the other foods that we use and how they affect. And it's not all the same. Some of them actually are are working on upregulating receptors and stuff like that. It's very cool. So we'll get there soon. Oh, I'm very excited. All righty. I am going to get started with our second video. Fingers and toes crossed for this tech transition. Come on over. Let's show you the ingredients here. We've got some rice flour coconut flour, eggs, vanilla, milk. In the recipe, it's almond milk, totally up to you. Cinnamon, apples, and maple syrup. So to start with, I'm gonna heat my pan at the back, and I'm gonna get a little bit of olive oil in there. Oh, I do need a little bit of sugar, just a tiny bit of sugar. And that's all I've got. One little pack of sugar. So, as that's going there, I'm going to take my apple and we're going to grate it. So, I'm going to grate it not too fine. I'm going to use the largest. Just like that. Then, what I want to do, I did it on the paper towel for a reason push it down and we'll get all that water out. And now I pop it in the pan. It's just a little bit of garnish. This is enough just for one person. And I just want to get a little bit of caramelized color on the apples with a little bit of sugar. That's what you do to caramelize any kind of sweet. And as that cooks down, it's going to be a lovely little topping. I'm gonna get going with my pancakes. Hardest thing with pancakes is always getting the right temperature on the pan. Don't want it too hot, you don't want it too cool, and that's why the first pancake never works. You've always gotta make the second and third because it gets to that right heat level. But I'm gonna try on the first, of course. Now, let's take flour, and we have measurements in the cookbook, but I'm just giving it a little bit of a guess you can always add more egg, you can always add more milk, you can always add more flour. So whenever you've got the consistency, if you know what the consistency looks like, that's all you really need to know. We will crack 
and egg into here. I will put some cinnamon in there. Nice, nice, generous helping. We want flavor. These are the ingredients we want is the cinnamon. So this is also what's learning about the cookbook is when you've got these ingredients that are 11 of these fabulous recipes, what we want to do is make sure we use them a little heavier. So if you've got black pepper, use black pepper a bit more. If we've got cinnamon, use cinnamon a little bit more. There is some vanilla. It's going to give a beautiful flavor to those pancakes. Going to add a little bit of sweetness in the pancakes. And we're going to put some maple syrup in there with some milk. Again, I'm not doing the recipe exactly. I'm giving it a bit of a guesswork, but I know what the consistency should be for the pancake. And actually, you know, if you don't know, pancakes and crepes are exactly the same. It's just what level you get that to. So at the moment, that is more like a dough, which we don't want. And I want to get that nice and loose. This is a very big whisk. Let me see if I get that out. There we go. I might need a bit more milk. I'm going to work that batter through. And the almond flour, I love. I love the almond flour on this one. I'm going to get a little bit more milk in there. I'm using regular 2%. You can use pretty much whatever you like, almond milk, um, soy, whatever kind of floats your boat. And we're gonna get that a little bit more combined. This is it, we're almost there. That's exactly what I want. You've gotta give it some elbow, get rid of lumps and bumps. Especially if you're using rice flour, you've gotta give it quite a go. Beautiful, lots of fresh fruit needs to go on that too. My apples are done. Just a nice little colour, a little bit of caramelisation. It's going to go on top and it's going to give a natural sweetness. Put a little bit of oil in here. Just a little bit. See how that's, you can see it's the right heat because the way the oil moves around. Now, let's get a big spoonful of a pancake. And then what happens, you can turn it up a little bit after, get a little bit of that oil in. You're gonna see little bubbles come up and those bubbles means it's time to flip it. Shouldn't take long. Again, remember a crepe is exactly the same. So French crepe, beautiful. Um, it's just a thinner consistency. So you can always do these in crepes and then you can wrap all that beautiful apple inside. So all you do is just add a little bit more milk. We wanna get some nice color on there. I'm going to take this garnish off now to speed things up. I'll tell you why. If I get that garnish off, I can then be doing another pancake over here because we're going to stack them. So you can do two at a time. Drizzle of oil. And don't worry how you dump it in. It all kind of forms together in the end. This should be just about ready to flip. Can you see that? Just gonna get the apple off of the spatula. Let's give this a little turn. Perfect color, that's exactly what you want. That pan was a little bit hotter, so it's almost ready to go on that one. Turn that down a little, and it will just take a couple of seconds the other side too. So we're gonna stack those up. We're gonna give it a little bit of maple syrup, and it's gonna be beautiful. Look at those. Um, and again, what you can do if you want to get a little bit more volume in that, take the egg white, whisk it until it soft peaks, then add it, and then you get a little bit more air in these and you can make nice and fluffy. Okay, let's do three. Heat in that. Always with the pancakes, the trick is just consistently checking on the temperature. Right just in time for that one. But you don't want it too hot, you don't want it too cool, so it's just consistent. Then I take this. Another pancake. I think three is gonna be just about perfect. This one is almost ready, I'm taking the heat off. Another beautiful fluffy pancake. 
And remember, you've got cinnamon, and that's what's gonna make this absolutely the benefit. The benefit is the cinnamon. That's the cannabinoids. That's what's gonna work, and Dr. Joe's gonna to talk to you all about it. Questions as well, so he'll tell you in more detail um, why it's so important. He's got a brilliant practice. He doesn't not believe in prescription medicine. It's not that he's anti and against it. He just tries to treat as much as he can through food. That's really important, isn't it? I mean, if you can make a difference through food, it's amazing. This is a whole different level because this is kind of enhancing lifestyle for that too. So this is almost done. And then I'll show you our three finished dishes all together. Take that off the heat, nice and hot. Give it a little drizzle of maple syrup. And always look for the pure, pure maple syrup. Most of the cheap ones are just synthetic and full of sugar, but there are some amazing, real Canadian maple syrups that are pure. They're very much, you know, more out of the budget. They're definitely expensive, but they are worth it because they're so good for you. A little bit of cinnamon, extra. And our apple goes on top there. And these are two dishes that I hope you can make at home. I hope you can make and have that wonderful realization of what cannabinoids can do. And then come over here, I wanted to show you the beauty of this. Are you ready to dive in? Take a look at this egg. There is your truffle pasta. And look at that beautiful poached egg. That becomes part of the sauce. That becomes all kind of put together with that amazing aroma of truffle. So. Back to you, Dr. Joe, I hope you've enjoyed. I hope we've got lots of questions and um, we hope we can get you into cannabinoids. Thanks everyone. Uh, those are cinnamon sticks. Cinnamon, which um, this is, uh, it's from the bark of multiple, you know, different species of the cinnamon family. Uh, it's really, as I said, this is all thousands of years old because it uh, comes from the, the Hebrew word kinamon which uh, was described as one of the ingredients in the incense that was used uh, in the temple. Cinnamon was one of them, it has that great smell. In fact, the, the, uh, uh, the Egyptians used it as part of their embalming when they would embalm mummies. Um, and the Romans, uh, they were very big on cinnamon. In fact, um, a, a pound of cinnamon could cost four years of wages. Uh, the Arabian traders used to tell the um, Romans, this is, I think, why it became so rare and therefore the cinema market was so good that it came from mythical cinnamon birds, which is not actually uh, accurate. It comes from a tree, but that would hike up the price of the product because they were mythical cinnamon birds um, native to China and in Indonesia. And it has that smell. That's an aldehyde. Uh, the chemistry is important, uh, called cinnamaldehyde, which is found as a, in an essential oil of cinnamon, gives that extraordinary flavor. Um, lots of health benefits. I'm just going to go over this. So just remember, 100 grams of cinnamon, that's a lot. But just to give you some idea, that is going to give you 100% of your recommended daily amount of calcium. You're not going to eat 100 grams of cinnamon, but it's high in calcium. It's high in iron. Calcium is important in multiple effects, including bone health, but also, uh, 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 frankly, in heart health. Um, and a vitamin K, which is important in bone health and obviously in clotting. Um, it's got polyphenols in the cinnamon, which are antioxidants. Um, what are antioxidants? As part of normal metabolism, our bodies make these free radicals. They are part of metabolism and they are destructive to DNA. So we have antioxidants. We make them in our body like glut glutathione, but we also consume them and polyphenols, which are found in wine and green tea and chocolate are also found in cinnamon and they are antioxidants to counter the effect of free radicals. Free radicals, uh, there's a theory that actually it's part of the aging process. There's more to aging than just that. Um, cinnamon reduces blood sugar, probably has a 
reduction in the glycemic index. So that's why I was less upset that we were using uh, uh, maple syrup, which would normally increase your blood sugar very quickly because it has a high glycemic index. And he was also using sugar, but adding the cinnamon will counteract the fact of the, the, the effect of that. Um, so it also in clinical studies has been shown to blood uh, reduce blood sugar, cholesterol, triglycerides, blood pressure, insulin resistance, improvement in that. And we actually use cinnamon quite a lot in uh, patients with diabetes. As Daniel said, I don't use drugs, so I better use something else. Cinnamon is one of my friends. Um, uh, and then uh, in terms of the brain, it's preventing the buildup of the tau protein, which I'm not sure how much you guys know about tau proteins, but tau protein is associated with Alzheimer's disease. So this prevents its buildup, which is obviously very useful. Um, and then in terms of cancer, cancer, which is uh, cells that divide and over time mutate, eventually the blood vessels, they, they, they will go into the blood vessels and then they'll start and to the lymphatic vessels and they'll start getting causing, causing metastasis and spread of cancer to distant organs. Um, and we actually have seen in uh, studies in test tube that cinnamon prevents that uh, angiogenesis, it's called in medicine, meaning procreation of blood vessels for cancer. It actually seems to prevent that. So again, specifically very useful effects. Um, and like most uh, essential oils, cinnamon contains multiple uh, different complex uh, compounds like terpenes, uh, which are gonna have anti-cancer uh, effects on cancer cells in the test tube. Um, it's antimicrobial, again, the same as most essential oils. And this is actually, cinnamon is another high beta carophyllin uh, containing uh, food. So the essential oil of cinnamon, again, the more you use, the more you're going to be taking a high beta carophyllin diet, which is the main one of the main terpenes found in cannabis sativa. And that is a direct CB2 agonist working on the CB2 receptors and therefore probably having uh, the effect on pain and, and reduction in uh, uh, inflammation. So um, those, cinnamon was one of them. I have two others I want to go over, and then I want to bang into uh, any questions uh, and wrap up because of the late hour. Um, so what we're going to talk about now is omega-3s. You all know about omega-3s. I'm going to pretty quickly go over omega-3s. But the point that people really don't know about omega-3s is the effect that omega-3s have on the endocannabinoid system, and a la apropos to the cascade, to the entourage effect, this works differently. This is not working by the beta carophyllin. This is not pure anandamide. This works on the receptors of the endocannabinoid system. So let's go into it. So omega-3s, these are um, polyunsaturated fats. You have omega-6, you have omega-3. Uh, there is alpha linoleic acid, there's EPA, there's DHA. ALA is the plant one. EPA and DHA are the animal ones. They're derived from fish oil. So you get them from tuna and salmon and herring and mackerel and sardines and anchovy. They are a big staple in the Mediterranean diet. And also the plant source is walnuts and hemp. Here we go. Uh, and chia, soy, kidney beans. And it's important to have a diet that is high in omega-3s, uh, plant and uh, uh, fish, uh, fish if, you, if you eat fish. Not everybody eats fish or can eat fish. Um, so what we know from studies, again, everything I tell you here has clinical studies to, uh, to, to show its, its um, uh, accuracy and validity. People who have consume omega-3s, this is not supplements, obviously my area of focus is supplements, but just consuming them in your diet. And I would say the main protein in my personal diet is fish. That's probably my main protein. Um, they have less depression, they have less anxiety, they have less dementia, they have less ADD. And I use high doses of fish oil, especially high EPA fish oil for those uh, uh, mental health challenges. Uh, DHA is the major component of the retina. Um, and so therefore, uh, some of the fish oils that we will use in eye health are going to be high in DHA, which uh, seems to reduce the risk of macular degeneration, which is a, a, a big cause of blindness. Omega-3s in terms of the heart, we know that it reduces triglycerides. It has a mild but significant effect on blood pressure. There are studies that came out not more than three weeks ago showing the effect uh, of blood pressure. We know that it actually reduces inflammation in the blood vessels, just to be clear. 
Heart disease is not just caused by cholesterol. Heart disease is related to inflammation. If the blood vessels get inflamed, that's not good. And this seems to counteract that. And nice as always, the uh, omega-3s will increase your HDL. And the HDL is the opposite of the LDL. If the, if the cholesterol goes to the arteries via the LDL, the cholesterol is taken from the arteries back to the liver for processing by the HDL. H for happy. So the more, the better. And this will increase your HDL. Uh, Omega-3s, um, actually, there are big studies on this, population studies. Consuming them in high amounts can reduce your risk of autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease is very complicated. This is just one element to that. Um, and for population studies, eating a diet that is high in omega-3s can be associated with a reduced incidence of colon, prostate, and breast cancer, which are some of the biggest cancers that we have uh, in terms of mortality, people dying, and people getting cancer. I'm not telling you that that will cure cancer. I'm telling you that you are reducing your risk. Remember, whenever we do this with any diet, what you are doing is trying to reduce your risk. You can't eliminate it, but you can reduce it. And you can also switch and switch on and off genes purely through diet, which is called epigenetics. Um, Omega-3s clearly have an anti-inflammatory effect, and we use them in arthritis all the time. Uh, they're also important in skin health uh, in terms of acne. That's an inflammatory condition and potentially omega-3s for aging. Um, so... What do they do in the endocannabinoid system? Uh, I said to you before, and I just want to remind you, anandamide and 2-AG are normal, are natural cannabinoids we make in our body, what we call in medicine, the endogenous cannabinoids, 2-AG uh, uh, and anandamide, they are derived from omega-6. Omega-6 is found in vegetable oils, cotton oil, this type of thing. The human American diet uh, is actually predominantly high in because of vegetable oil consumption in omega-6. Omega-6 is actually much more inflammatory, whereas omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. And so it's important as best we can to try and reduce omega-6 and increase omega-3. Okay, so that's just medicine. Now, what does it do to the endocannabinoid system? So here's how it goes. If your diet is too high in omega-6s, vegetable oil, processed food, what happens is because that is the natural, basically substrate, as we say in medicine, in other words, that is what the body is gonna make the 2-AG and the nanamide out of, the, uh, uh, what will happen is if you have too much omega-6, there will be a down regulation, meaning the body will start to reduce the number of CB1 and CB2 receptors in the body. Literally, there will be a down regulation. Um, in the same way as there's an upregulation if you uh, exercise, that upregulates the amount of receptors you get. In other words, there are more receptors, which means the system can work better. There's more stimulation of the endocannabinoid system um, if you have more receptors. But if you have too much omega-6, you're going to downregulate that because you're taking, you're making, you're taking too much omega-6. The body doesn't want to make too much amandamide and 2-AG, doesn't want to overstimulate the endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system is put down by down regulation of these receptors. So what happens if you take a higher omega-3 diet, which are healthy for all those reasons? You get up regulation, you get more receptors. So in other words, there's more CB1 and CB2 receptors in the body because there's a higher amount of omega-3, there's less omega-6. And that is another way using the entourage cascade effect we have of stimulating the entire system. That is not a CB1 or CB2 agonist. That is not beta carophylline that's not anandamide, that is literally working on the receptors. So that's one food I think is important. And my final food before I take any final questions is cacao. And this has a completely different effect on the endocannabinoid system, but it's chocolate, my friends. And how can chocolate be anything other than awesome? Theobroma cacao. 
Theobroma cacao. This was used, it's obviously originally from uh, South America. The Mayan civilization considered chocolate to be the food of the gods in the same way as in Greece, it was ambrosia, was the food of the gods. And it, uh, it gave you supernatural life forces. I eat dark chocolate every single day of my life because it has incredible health benefits. And the traditional use was that it was actually used to reduce inflammation, which doesn't surprise me because Part of the effect of cacao is working on the endocannabinoid system and probably reducing inflammation. So the ancients, as usual, had it right. Uh, just to give you some frame of reference, you've got the cacao tree. South America takes five years to make the fruit. Uh, to, and then the fruit they grow, you get the beans. And then the math is beyond me. 40 beans make one pound of dark chocolate. They need three million tons of cacao per year. So we need 240 billion cacao beans, cocoa beans per year in order to sustain us with our chocolate uh, heart, uh, our chocolate needs. I'm gonna talk about what it does to the endocannabinoid system in a second, but before I do, let me just give you some other important benefits to eating a high dark chocolate food, like an 85% cacao. It is higher in fiber, and lower in sugar. In other words, 85% or above, you actually have more sugar per serving, excuse me, fiber per serving than sugar. So this has no relationship to Hershey's Kisses. This is not the same food. This is a medicinal food that has lots of health promoting properties. It's full of manganese, magnesium and iron, and manganese and copper and potassium and zinc and selenium and polyphenols. I could spend 10 minutes talking about each of those uh, um, each of those uh, um, uh, important uh, minerals, I won't other than to say they're all incredibly important in human health. Deficiency is not good and you can get them from dark chocolate. Um, dark chocolate has some very neat properties, one of which is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is how we dilate our blood vessels and it increases nitric oxide. It also increases HDL, which I told you about. So there's fish oil and HDL is the good one. It also, um, uh, because of the nitric oxide, actually increases blood flow to the brain. And people get concerned when they look at the ingredients of, of uh, dark chocolate because it seems to have a lot of saturated fat. And we've all been taught that saturated fat is bad. I don't want to get into the discussion about saturated fat other than to say the saturated fat in dark chocolate is not the same as saturated fat in other foods because it's stearic acid and stearic acid does not have any effect on the LDL cholesterol. There are other saturated fats that will increase the bad cholesterol, but this one won't. Okay, so let's finish off by saying, what does chocolate, theobroma cacao, how does that work on the endocannabinoid system? Again, different mechanism of action. So just to remind everybody, anandamide is broken down by, a, by F A A H. okay? We all know that because you all uh, you're very familiar with uh, the endocannabinoid system. So that's how we break down the anandamide. Well, it turns out that in dark chocolate you have n linenal ethanolamide and n oleoethanolamide, and they are direct inhibitors of FAH enzyme. So obviously, if you inhibit the enzyme that breaks down anandamide, you get the anandamide levels to remain high, and you are stimulating your endocannabinoid system, add some pure anandamide through truffles, increase the number of CB receptors you have in your brain by having a high omega-3 diet, and obviously having a diet full of cinnamon and through uh, and black pepper, which are going to stimulate the uh, CB2 receptors through beta carophyllin terpenes, that is cannabinoid rich food. That's what the concept of the book is. There are other ingredients. We've got 11 chapters and each one has 10 recipes and we're using multiple different cannabinoids at the same time. The main part of the book is it is a cookbook. And so if you want to know how to have a cannabinoid rich diet, get the book and, you, and, and get cooking. And that's it, my friends. Thank you so much, Dr. Joe. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'd love to see if we have any more questions before I close up our call. I know I learned some fascinating things that I had no idea about omega threes. Another great reason to look uh, to, to eat your balanced diets. So oh. please do pop a question in the chat. Use that Q and A tool, or raise your hand, and we'll give that voice to answer one more try before we close up for today. Oh. 
Thank you so. I'm I'm very flattered by the. Now I can see the chat, and I am I'm honoured. I'm really very excited to talk to you guys because Oaksterdam is well known, and I'm talking to people who know about this system. So you'll get the nuance. You'll get actually what this is really about. But it is for the world because it's part of a movement, and we're trying to get this to get to more people because uh, people should be using this just like they use chocolate, and Absolutely. they should use chocolate. <laughs> Amen to that. Yeah. Okie dokie. So um, everybody do check out the links in the chat there. There's a 10% discount code to purchase the cannabinoid cookbook and check out our courses here at Oxford University. We have a couple of free courses. We do asynchronous and live programs. We'll be sending an email to all the participants in the next couple of days. And that email is going to have a link to a recording of today's webinar and also to those recipes that we've all been wondering about. So thank you again, Dr. Joe. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And I look forward to the next one. Ta-ra! Yeah,